Sarah underscore May Wong. And, uh, I'm talking today about my experience of being a professional woman in England in 2015. Um, and what that is like. And uh, you would have noticed that I am not a child or a young woman. Um, and so I'm also in a situation where I'm in that over 45 category that uh, Paul was talking about. So my perspective I have now is very different from the one I had when I was 20. And we'll get on to that in a second. My title being Drowning in a Drip Feed of Molten Glass will be apparent in a moment. Um, so this talk is a description of my experience with reference to others, but it's largely about how I experience things. Um, so it isn't about trying to demonstrate that there is a glass ceiling. I'm not actually going to be talking numbers or anything about it. I know there's lots of other people doing that today, so I don't feel like I need to cover that. Um, but it is my explanation of the nature of the leaky pipeline, which is a phrase people talk about, about how can you have a, a, a discipline or a profession that starts off with equal numbers of men and women and ends up with so few men, so few men leaving and so, few, so many women leaving. Um, so why are they going? What's, what's the nature of that pipeline? I also want it to be an affirmation for women in the discipline, um, which I think is one of the things we need to have in any call for action. So that would be what I'm up to today. And I have a very basic argument, which is the problem for women in the profession, and therefore the problem the profession has with gender equality, is patriarchy. Now, patriarchy is a word that people often get really frightened, especially when women say it. But I think it's really useful um, to, to, to get into this very directly, because patriarchy, like um, any other system of power is a system of power, and it's a system of power where um, power is vested in relation to gender. Okay, so it is that because it's a system as opposed to the actions of individuals. The actions of individuals can affect the system, but they are not what we are discussing when we are discussing the issues. We're discussing the way that there is a structure in place that holds power in this fashion. And while we live under a patriarchy, we cannot expect that there will be any specific discipline, particularly any culturally important discipline, such as heritage and archaeology, that will have a significantly different power arrangement, because that's not the way power works. So that's my basic argument. <laughs> yeah, we'll look at the details. Um, and I'm going to step back and do, as I say, some things. So this is a photograph from an MA field trip that I went on in 1991. We were on our way to Orkney. And there were more people in my MA class, but this was just the people who were um, still sober enough to be photographed, um, uh, to a certain extent. <laughs> um, and as I put here, guess who has academic positions now? So we have a group of women and men, mostly women, two men. What have we got? Out of the results, both of the men have academic positions, including the one who didn't complete his MA. Uh, none of the women have academic lecturing positions, although I have recently been given a postdoc position. So the rest of them, most of those women have left archaeology, the rest of them are in relatively precarious consulting positions. Is that because the men got the best results in the MA? No. Um, is it possibly because they made better career choices than the women? Absolutely. And for a very long time, um, I assumed the fact that the men that I had been colleagues with when I was younger, zooming past me, was because I was making poor career choices. Um, uh, or that I wasn't working hard enough. Something I say to myself a lot. If I just worked a bit harder, it would be all fine. And it really wasn't until somebody put this picture up that it crystallized to me. It may be that I've made poor career choices. It may be that I'm lazy. But it's not really likely that everybody in my MA class who was a woman made poor career choices or was lazy. And then it really was, and that was quite recently, that I thought, you know what? <laughs> Look at that. Um, this is actually a structural problem. So, that's, I want to say, continuing the, uh, continuing the personal aspect, this is a very blurry photograph, but as I say, I am perfectly happy with my career. And when I say I've made poor career choices, part of the reason that I'm just getting a postdoc now is because I've made different career choices. And I've worked for 10 years for English Heritage as was, and was very happy and got a lot out of that. In heritage, or now historically, has its own glass ceilings issues. Um, uh, but I was certainly well supported with English heritage 
And I should say that generally speaking, one of the reasons it took me so long to realize that there might be a structural problem is that in a professional capacity, I had never felt that someone discriminated against me because I was a woman. I never feel that I haven't got a job because I, didn't, uh, because I was a woman. I don't get shut up because I'm a woman. Kind of hard to shut me up, to be honest, but <laughs> I don't get shut up because I'm a woman. And I don't even really think that an awful lot of my project proposals got overlooked because of a woman. I might go back and go, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. But, you know, realistically speaking, it wasn't obvious. So, and I now have a position in a really lovely project um, that is mostly women. There's usually one man and there's one other man in the project. And it's a good, big project, well-funded, mostly women. So it's kind of easy to think to yourself, well, that's fine, really. And that's where that whole glass parasol comes in. But the problem is, is that pervasive sexism is exhausting. And this is basically what I mean when I talk about a drip feed of molten glass. From the time a woman is born, she is constantly bombarded with various images telling her that she is less important than men, less capable than men, valuable largely for her attractiveness to men, etc., etc., etc. Each one of these instances, each one of these bombardments, you can brush off and imagine a splash of glass. But over time, they build up. Over time, they get heavier. And that's how come some people, over time, find it harder to keep moving and give up. <clears throat> and that is basically what my, the, the argument that I have to make. Now, here is some of the drip feed as I talk about <coughs> This is the drip feed that you get. I hope you can read some of these. I've probably made them quite big enough, have I? These are things that I picked up in half an hour on Twitter, largely. Little things, senior managers saying, keep up the testosterone levels when talking about leadership. Little tiny drips that constantly, constantly go on. They, and these things, in many ways, are, are actually more difficult. This one I love. This is, uh, this is uh, gender distinguished earplugs. <laughs> and we'll notice that the men are heroes, whereas the women are sleeping pretty in pink. Um, now, when I was a young woman in 1991, I thought that sexism was behind us. My mother and her generation had worked really, really hard to try and make sexism be behind us. And we all grew up thinking it was behind us. But that little display of bits and pieces of social media, clips and clips of, of, of newsprint, etc., indicates that, if anything, it is resurgent. Yeah? There is increasing amounts of this kind of needless gender distinction. There's increasing amounts of <clears throat> attacks on women in the public sphere if they try to speak in the public sphere. Um, and that it is not basically over. And I think some, some of the reason it took, again, it took me so long to realize there might be a structural problem, is that I was so sure that it was over. And so, to sort of prefigure what I'm going to say at the end, one of the most important things we need to do is recognize that it is not over, um, that it is something that is continuing. So when you look, I do a Google search for CEO, <laughs> this is the first female face that you run across. <laughs> So Barbie is our best female CEO. Um, we don't have, now, of course, there are lots of other CEOs, but what are they tagged as? You know, some of these things are about the relationship of, of the way things are, are, are saying. But this does give you a kind of what does a young woman growing up get bombarded with? Now, of course, it's bear, worth bearing in mind, as I know that there are a lot of people who, like when I was that age, feel like the world is before you. And of course, it is. And um, as I said earlier, may feel I am not getting any sexism. I'm not, people aren't treating me any differently because I'm a woman. Um, but even if you are not experiencing these yourself, even if you're not actually seeing these things, even if you're managing to avoid all the media, all of the billboards as you walk along the road, everything like that, other people are seeing it. And they're forming their opinions about who you are based on those kinds of things. And those things cause other structural issues, and the most specific ones I want to speak about today are um, stereotype threat and imposter syndrome, which are linked. Stereotype threat is a, a specific problem there's been a lot of research on, which says that, which has, has, has demonstrated, which says if you take a member of a, t a stereotyped group 
and you give them a test. Just give them a test. And then you take another set of people from the same stereotype group and say that people from that group tend to do poorer on that test. People tend to do poorer on that test. So as soon as you're reminded that you're a member of the group that shouldn't be able to do this, you can't do it so well anymore. Um, so this drip feed that you get isn't just an irritation. It isn't just something that you can laugh about. It's something that's actually affecting women's confidence on a daily basis. Which, of course, then, leads to imposter syndrome. Now, of course, members of both genders, in fact, all genders, suffer from imposter syndrome. It's one of those things that you can't really get away from, particularly in a discipline like archaeology, where I suspect there are quite a few imposters that you were you might be one of. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, um, it is something that, again, there's a lot of research to show that women suffer from it much more than others. Women suffer um, a much greater sense that they are incompetent to do the job that they have been asked to do. And it's probably really related to stereotype threat. Um, that, that experience is probably related to stereotype threat. But so it isn't just that these things are irritating, or even just that they're tiring. They have demonstrable um, effects on competency, which build up over time. And it starts young. This is one of my recent favorites. Yeah, those are onesies on sale in a university. <coughs> in the States. I hate my thighs and I'm super. Are the messages that babies are wrapped in from birth, right? And that was not the case when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> and so if we think about it, I was born and raised by people working hard against this kind of thing in a, in a, in a society that did not do this. What will be, it be like for girls who were wrapped in these things, you know? If people are still experiencing these problems even now, what will it be like in 20 years' time? And of course, after it starts young, it only gets worse, right? Here are two images from, of course, it has to be the sun, but um, uh, we have Guess the Celebrity Pairs, which is a mosaic of women's breasts, and page three poses the big question, boobs or bum? Can you, can you guess whether this is a photograph of someone's boobs or someone's bum? Um, so this is the image that is constantly perceived, given that actually your physical characteristics, and particularly your breasts and bottom, are the most important aspects of you. And in fact, they're so important that they can be distinguished from all, they can be cut apart from the rest of your body and um, observed, consumed, and assessed entirely independent of any other aspect of you. And that is the reality that faces women in Britain every day. Political power is no protection. So after the leaders debate, of course, they were all judged on how sexy they were. You miss people suggesting a woman leader must be flirting to agree with someone. And here is someone saying that Susanna Reid was flirting because she smiled at an interview. Teresa sat in a low-cut suit. No comment. And as Hillary Clinton has announced her intention to run for presidency, here's the bingo card for things that will be said about her. Uh, harpy, ball breaker bitch, there will be rape threats, what about the men? As soon as a woman is in a political context, this stuff comes up. And professional standing is no protection. This is the sport of professional cycling advertising themselves. And uh, this is someone from the surgeon. And this, another one of my favorites recently, is Frida Kahlo, the very famous painter. Uh, it says, wife of the master mural painter, gleefully dabbles in works of art. So being a professional, having your skills, totally irrelevant. Um, you will still be judged in this manner in public. And every time you speak, you probably many of you are aware of the experience that Mary Beard has had in, in the last few years, where the, the level of abuse and sexualized abuse that she receives for speaking in public is is, is really very overwhelming. And because, she's, because she has real power, you know, she is in fact a Dom. She actually has a huge amount of power behind her. And she has a lot of personal power that has come that she's built up with that. She's able to cope. And she tends, ten, tends to put them in their place. But that doesn't mean to say that A, it isn't exhausting to her. And B, it isn't um, something that causes her a difficulty. You know? Um, and, it be, and C, this is the one that's more important, the abuse that she receives frightens other women. 
Yeah, makes it more difficult to think, will I say something? Hmm. Um, so archaeology has extra challenges. Hypermobility, that we're constantly expected to move around, doesn't fit with the role that women are given under patriarchy that we should be the steady ones. Fieldwork harassment, I'm sure someone will bring it up, but there's been again, a number of studies recently published in Plus One about women's experience of harassment in the field, which does cause a great deal of difficulty for women working in the discipline. Um, unclear routes to clear career progression. Because it's not possible always to see what you ought to be doing to get ahead, it's more difficult to see, it's why it took me so long, that you not, might not be getting ahead because of things to do with gender, right? Because it's really not clear who's getting ahead or why. And it isn't until you can get right to the end that you can see it. Similarly, and this one I think is quite important, culture of overwork and poor work-life balance. This is a real problem for women because of the socially mandated caring roles that women are meant to take on. So when someone is writing a book in their spare time, Joe, <laughs> that puts pressure on women to write books in their spare time. And I actually don't have any spare time anymore. And um, so the idea that I can, can, can constantly find more time, it's corrosive to everyone, so we might as well give it up. Um, but it certainly is one of the things that makes it more difficult for women because of the extra social roles they have. Um, and again, I'm sure, I know there's a paper on parenting and that kind of thing today, so I haven't gone into that in much detail today. Um, and dead men's shoes. The stagnation of career progression in archaeology means that it is older people who are in senior positions, as, as Paul said. And that's important because men gain power as they age while women become visible. So these are a bunch of tweets, at what age do you make the transition from silly little girl to stupid old hag? And then there's a set of quotes coming here about disappearing. I'm 43 and I'm disappearing. Not so long ago, my mom and I were talking and she said something which is going to stick with me forever. When you're a woman over 40, you disappear. So if all of the power in archaeology is with people over 45, and women are disappearing when they hit 40, yeah, if they're socially invisible, which is definitely another thing that there's a fair amount of evidence on, it's a problem. Um, so this gives us the appearance of the glass ceiling, because as women progress, they get more and more weighed down, more and more tired, and as they get older, they're increasingly discounted. So at that point, that's when you get this sense of, oh, I hit a glass ceiling, or oh, someone else looking and say, oh, it's a glass ceiling. In fact, it's something that's been in operation all the way through. And as I say, career breaks, I'm referred to as breaks, uh, for socially mandated caring, either parenting or looking after older parents, even if you choose not to have children, even if you don't have children, um, that will exacerbate the situation. So that's how that glass ceiling appears. Boom. <laughs> what shall we do with that? Um, what we can do, one, first of all, to acknowledge the existent, the persistent and resurgent existence of sexism, and so that women who are experiencing it don't have to figure it out like for themselves if it's something that's up front. Challenge it as often as we can in all walks of life. It's not just something for the profession. It's something that actually needs for people to address at all times. And to recognize that sexism is an extra weight for women and accept that it can be exhausting for that reason. And so when you have women colleagues who are exhausted, take that into account. And I don't just mean physically exhausted, I mean psychically exhausted as well. And in that, we need to be able to support women throughout their careers and not only worry about this kind of point at which they're dropping off, but actually to recognize that it's something that happens from the get-go and it needs support from the get-go. And then Number two, this is more specific to archaeology, we need to pay specific attention to fieldwork conditions, um, both in terms of questions of harassment, but also in, in terms of that question of hypermobility. That's something that needs to be addressed. And clarify those progression routes. Make it clear what we can expect at any one time in our career so that we can judge for ourselves whether we are slipping backwards from where we might have expected to be. And finally, this culture of overwork and um, stopping that culture of overwork will be an improvement for everybody um, to recognize that it is a job, professional standing, and not something that we do with every breathing moment. And on that, I'll stop. <laughs>